Good afternoon and warm welcome to the second session of ACM India's education webinar series. I would like to thank you for the overwhelming response to the first session. COVID continues to disrupt our lives. My message to all of you is stay safe. And we at CS Parchala will continue to engage with you with meaningful discussions. I'm, C I'm Vipul Shah. I head education and skilling globally at Tata Consultancy Services and the CS Parchal Initiative at ACM India as well. Before continuing, I would like to just uh, share some housekeeping rules. The audience will be on silent mode at all times. As always, post your questions anytime using the Q&A window. We'll take the questions at the end of the talk and try to address as many questions as possible. The webinar recording will be available to view from tomorrow. Many of you know ACM India through the CS Parchella lens. This slide presents a gamut of things we do. ACM is the world's largest computing society and has been at the forefront of computing education. CS Parchella since its launch has come a long way. I would like to thank you for being part of this journey. Let us all work together to make computing available to all. Teachers, I'm pleased to announce that we are constituting the CS Parchala Computational Thinking in School Education Award to recognize your contribution to computing education in schools. This award will be given to an outstanding teacher at the CTIS Computational Thinking in School Conference. Please mark your calendar. CTIS will be held virtually on 2nd and 3rd October. Apart from the recognition, the award carries a sum of rupees 3 lakhs, of which 1 lakh will be awarded to the teacher and 2 lakh to the school. On behalf of CS Parshala team, I would like to take Infosys for awarding, for uh, constituting this award this year. <coughs> it's my pleasure to introduce today's host, Professor Ramanujam. Professor of Computer Sciences in, at the Indian Institute of Mathematical Science. Teachers, all the things that you like about the CS Parshala curriculum is really thanks to him, <coughs> as he is the architect behind the CS Parshala curriculum. Working with school teachers and students is his passion. It was a proud moment for us when he received the Indira Gandhi Prize for Popularization of Science for 2020 award. I'd like to welcome Jam, and I, Jam, I hand it over to you to take us through the session. Thank you, Vipul. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of the day, Dr. Janaki Ghosh of the Elementary Education, Lady Sriram College, University of Delhi. A uh, uh, known math educator, especially in the area of uh, use of technology in mathematics education, and a lot of passion to professional development of mathematics teachers. She, uh, she's one of the editors of a very important magazine called Art Right Angles, which I would strongly recommend to many of the teachers present here. Uh, Janaki is one of the persons who set up the Ramanujan Foundation for Initiative in Mathematics Education. It's a voluntary group and uh, has inspired uh, a whole number of uh, teachers across India in mathematics education. It's a pleasure to have her here. She's been talking about opportunities for computational thinking in the mathematics classroom and uh, uh, bringing in strands from use of technology, use of computational thinking, mathematical thinking, many things. And it's very appropriate to have her here today telling us about uh, how we can relate computational thinking and mathematics. Over to Janet. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramanujan, for that kind introduction. Uh, it is really an honor to be uh, part of this uh, webinar. And I especially like to thank C.S. Patshala and Mr. Vipul Shah, and of course, uh, Jam, for having me here. And uh, so the topic uh, of today is uh, computational thinking in the mathematics classroom. I guess when we talk about computational thinking, uh, we cannot uh, talk of it without mentioning the name of Samuel Papert. Uh, Papert, way back in the 1960s, had actually talked about, uh, had coined this phrase, 
and uh, he vividly talked about children using computers as instruments for learning and for enhancing creativity, innovation, and in a way, concretizing computational thinking. Uh, in his book, The Mindstorms, he uh, actually shows how mathematics can be a natural playground for computational thinking. And uh, he talked about, uh, in fact, he and his team had developed logo programming and turtle geometry, which in, through which he introduced a computational style of learning geometry. So this book was published in the 1980s, but I think Papert was way ahead of his times in the way he thought that computers will change how children learn and think, not only in mathematics, but in many subject domains. Uh, uh, the person who's, uh, who actually, uh, uh, an important paper which kind of popularized the term computational thinking uh, was by Jeanette M. Wing, a professor of computer science in uh, University of Columbia, who uh, she published this paper in 2006. Uh, there's a small snapshot of this on the screen. Uh, she said computational thinking is a fundamental skill for everyone and not just for computer scientists. So to reading, writing, and arithmetic, that is the three R's, as we say, we should add computational thinking to every child's analytical ability. Her way of interpreting computational thinking is probably restricted it more to computer science. But uh, when we look at computational thinking, it's perhaps even hard to come up with any common definition which uh, suits everybody. But it is indeed considered to be a broad skill set applicable across contexts, domains, and in fact probably needs to be and is being integrated in most subjects of the K-12 to curriculum. Mathematics can provide context to integrate uh, computational thinking, and computation in turn can enrich mathematics learning through technology. So there is a synergistic relationship between uh, CT and MT, if you like. And the PISA 2021 mathematics framework acknowledges this and says that the long-term trajectory of mathematical literacy should also encompass the synergistic and reciprocal relationship between mathematical thinking and computational thinking. But when we come to uh, practitioners, that is teachers and curriculum makers, it is a challenge to identify tasks which are probably both mathematically and computationally rich. So in this presentation, I hope to show that the topic of fractals uh, and games such as the Tower of Hanoi, which is a very popular game and many might be familiar with it, these can offer opportunities to engage in both MT and CT. And uh, some of these have been tried as experiments uh, with school children and also with uh, early first year undergraduate students who did not have, uh, who were not, who did not have mathematics to uh, even in grades 11 and 12 in their school. So fractals occur abundantly in nature and they exhibit uh, uh, self similarity. Uh, so in fact, I just want to share some pictures. So if you look at some fern leaves, you would notice that uh, the leaf has a central branch, and along that there are smaller leaves. And along those smaller leaves also there are yet smaller leaves. And if you magnify a small portion of this, uh, it would probably resemble the larger leaf itself. Similar structures can be seen in the branching system of a tree, where there's a central branch which splits into uh, smaller branches, and those smaller branches still split into yet smaller branches. So if you look at a smaller portion of the branching system, it in a way resembles the whole uh, tree. Even vegetables such as uh, cauliflower and broccoli, if you look at uh, small portions and magnify them, they resemble the whole. So fractals exhibit similar patterns in progressively smaller scales. And Children can be made to explore the idea of fractals, uh, but this can be done nicely through some well-known, very well-known geometrical fractals. And uh, the simplest one, perhaps, is the very well-known Sierpinski Triangle, which was named after uh, the Polish mathematician Wojciech Sierpinski. Uh, it is a geometrical fractal which can be generated using a recursive process. So you start with uh, an equilateral triangle. So imagine that what you see on the slide is a, a cardboard piece, a black colored cardboard piece, in shape like an equilateral triangle. 
if you join the midpoints of the three sides, uh, you would get four smaller equilateral triangles and you remove the center triangle. So what you would get is something which looks like this. So the white portion is actually removed, so it's actually a hole, and three smaller equilateral triangles remain. Now this process of joining the midpoints and removing the center triangle is repeated on this, and you would arrive at this, and now there are nine smaller equilateral triangles, and again, in on those nine triangles, you repeat the same process and you would get another shape that you can see here. Well, these are stages of the uh, recursive process. And if we number them, they're usually numbered from stage zero. So the initial stage, which is also called you know, the do nothing stage, is uh, numbered as stage zero. And thereafter, the stages are numbered. So what are the interesting questions that come to your mind? Suppose you were to present this task to children, what would you like them to explore? Perhaps the question could be asked, is that how many black or shaded triangles will there be at the next few stages? So they would, uh, you would want them to extend this pattern further and predict what would be the number of, sorry, uh, what would be the number of shaded triangles? Uh, also, can they find a rule for the number of shaded triangles at the end of stage? So that you would like them to generalize the pattern. And uh, so one is related to the number of shaded black triangles at any given stage. And the other would be perhaps that if the area of the initial stage zero is say one square unit, then what would be the areas at the subsequent stages? And finally, it would be interesting to know what would happen as n increases without bound. For example, n represents the number of stages. So if the stages go, go on increasing, what would this fractal really look like? So on this slide, as you can see uh, beneath the pictorial representation of the Sierpinski triangle, there is a table. And it would be good to get children to tabulate their observations. So on the first row, you know, the stages may be numbered from zero onwards, and the general uh, stage is represented by n, the nth stage. And let the number of uh, black triangles be represented by t of n. So at stage zero, there is uh, one triangle. At stage two, uh, at stage one, there are three triangles. At stage two, there are nine, and so on. So there are powers of three. And children, when they write this in powers of three, they immediately observe that the exponent of three and the stage number coincide. So that helps them to conjecture that the number of triangles at the nth stage would be three raised to the power n. Similarly, if you look at the area at stage zero, if it is one square unit, to obtain stage one, it is divided into four equal parts, and uh, the center part is removed. So therefore, there are actually uh, three equilateral triangles, but this would be three-fourth of the previous stage. So at every stage happens to be a three-fourth of its previous stage, and we get for shaded area, we get a geometric sequence uh, whose uh, multiplying factor is three upon four. So this itself is interesting to children. And they can be encouraged to write the recursive rules. So for example, the number of shaded triangles, uh, t of n is 3 times. So t of n will be 3 times t of n minus 1. And the shaded area at the nth stage is 3 by 4 times s n minus 1. Uh, so we are, they're expressing the nth stage in terms of the previous stage, which is the n minus 1 at stage. So this generalization, both in the explicit and recursive form, is an important aspect of mathematical thinking. Now, uh, if it is difficult to observe the Sierpinski triangle at higher stages because it's difficult to draw it manually, there are computer programs which do that. But right now, I will just take you to a um, spreadsheet. So I will share my screen. So please let me know if my screen is visible to you when a spreadsheet opens up. So is the screen visible to the audience? OK. I hope the screen is visible to the audience.
Okay, so in this spreadsheet, you would see that column A represents the stage numbers, which is already input. I've already input that. The number of triangles uh, at stage zero is one. And to obtain the sequence of the number of triangles, I would insert three raised to the power, the stage number. And for the shaded area, I will enter three by four raised to the power, the stage number. And when we double click on this, we can see that the number of shaded triangles actually grows very rapidly, whereas the shaded area is approaching zero. And quickly, this can be graphed. So we go to charts and look for a line graph. So we see the number of triangles growing fairly rapidly. And if you look at the shaded area and draw a similar graph, we would see that the shaded area goes to zero. So two opposite things are happening as the stage numbers are increasing. And the spreadsheet is a nice way to explore it quickly, numerically as well as graphically. So I'll now stop sharing my screen. Uh, just a little feedback. I hope this is uh, all. I'm audible clearly, and all this was visible. Okay. Uh, so moving further, let us look at uh, the self-similarity within the Sierpinski triangle. If we look at stage three of the Sierpinski triangle, this is stage three, and I circle a portion of it. The circle portion is actually stage two, and you can see that stage three has three copies of stage two. So there are three parts to this. If I enlarge stage two and circle a portion of this, I see that stage two has three copies of stage one, because the one inside the circle is stage one. So stage one is repeated three times in stage two. And I enlarge now stage one. And again, in this, we see that the single triangle is stage zero. So stage one has three copies of stage zero. Now, I pose a question to the audience. Uh, this is a Sapinski triangle stage three. And I'm going to circle a portion of it, which is stage one. If you notice the small circle here, this is stage one. How many copies of this stage one do we see in stage three? So that the question is, I repeat, how many copies of stage one do we see in stage three? So the question will come up on your slide. So please, uh, the question is, how many copies of stage one are there in stage three? So I request the audience to select their option and please click on submit. So we look at the audience poll now. So that's wonderful. Uh, that is the correct answer. About 70% of the audience feels that there are nine copies of stage one in stage three. That's excellent. So moving forward, uh, let us look at, uh, so the Sierpinski triangle is also called the Sierpinski gasket or sieve. And this is a higher stage of the Sierpinski triangle. It is, as I said, you need computer programs to generate these. And uh, the Mathematica is a software which is available on Wolfram Cloud. And it has a command called Sierpinski Mesh, which allows you to actually generate any stage of the Sierpinski triangle up to a certain stage, of course. So uh, could you guess what stage of the Sierpinski triangle this might, might be, what you see, can see on the screen? So just as a small hint, maybe if you look at the very top little portion, this is stage one. And three copies of stage one actually make stage two, and so on. 
So if you look at this recursive pattern of self-similarity, the question to you is, can you identify which stage of the Sierpinski triangle this is? So again, this is a question for the audience. And please select and click on Submit. So that's a very interesting thing that uh, about 42.9 people have shared that, yes, it is indeed stage six. Uh, one needs to look at it carefully. I apologize that I could not show the slide for a sufficiently long time. But yes, the idea is that to see that even at stage six, it is a fairly intricate pattern. And uh, children can be given these kind of tasks to, given a certain stage, they can identify and then they will engage with the idea of self-similarity. So moving on, uh, Pascal's triangle is something that children often uh, engage with, especially in class 11. Uh, they do the binomial theorem. So the Pascal's triangle consists of binomial coefficients. So if you look carefully at this triangular grid, it consists of hexagonal cells. Uh, in, to obtain any value inside any of these cells, you have to add the numbers just in the row above it. So for example, 3 plus 3 here is 6, and uh, 4 plus 6 is 10, and so on. So it is very easy to generate subsequent rows of the Pascal's triangle. But suppose I were to uh, replace all the odd numbers in this triangle by one and all the even numbers in this triangle by zero. That is, if I were to reduce this triangle modulo two and color, give it a coloring, for example, the cells with odd numbers or cells with one are to be colored and the cells with zero, that is with even numbers, are to be left unshaded. So what really comes up is the Sierpinski triangle. And this comes as a big surprise to children. And the task that could be assigned to them is how can they generate the coloring rule? So suppose you give them a blank grid consisting of hexagonal cells. Can they do the coloring row-wise without having to think about the numbers? So one way to, to do this is to translate the coloring pattern into odd and even. So black cells are odd-numbered cells. So if there are two black cells, uh, adjacent cells, then the cell just below it will be a white cell because odd plus odd is even. And similarly, if there are two even cells which are white, then the cell just below it will also be white, which is even. But if there is a black and a white cell, then that would lead to a black cell because odd plus even is odd. So using this concept of odd and even numbers, they can simply color the triangle. And in the next slide, what you can see is snapshots of students' work. So this is very interesting because they actually engage with modular arithmetic. They did the coloring and it led to interesting artwork. And the children said that uh, these were done with grades 9 and 10, uh, students of grade 9 and 10. And they said, why should we just restrict ourselves to modulo 2? Why not modulo 3? So then they reduced Pascal triangle modulo 3, in which case the triangle had numbers 0, 1, and 2. So they gave three different colors to the cells. Uh, so cell 0 was left white and they got a different variation of the Sierpinski triangle. And this kind of extended to uh, a very interesting project where students divided themselves into groups, and each group was trying a different modulo coloring, and uh, it led to very interesting patterns. And uh, it, was, it was a project which was actually displayed also in a certain exhibition. Another interesting game which I like to introduce, and it is somewhat related to the Sierpinski triangle, is the chaos game. So the chaos game consists of an equilateral triangle where the vertices may be, let us say, labeled with T. T stands for top, L for the left, and R for the right. So this is a equilateral triangle. And you can start with any initial point inside or on the triangle. Let us say we start with point A. And then you roll a dice. So if one and two come up, then we move halfway towards the vertex T. If three or four turn up, you move halfway towards the vertex L. And if five or six turn up, you may move halfway towards the vertex R. So depending on the throw of the roll of the dice. And the probability of going towards any of these vertex is equally likely because each has probability one by three. So suppose I get two in my first roll, I start with A, 
and I take the midpoint of AT and mark it as B. So I don't need the line, it is just there for to show you. We just mark the midpoint P. Then I roll the dice again, suppose I get a four, so I have to move towards L, halfway towards L. So I mark the midpoint from B to L, which is C. And I continue to do it this way. When you have a large number of iterations, you'll have a large number of dots inside this equilateral triangle. What do you think really happens? So children can be given this task, you know, they can work in pairs. One child can do the uh, rolling of the dice and the other can actually mark the midpoints. You need uh, at least a larger number of midpoints, let's say around 150 to 200 points would show that some kind of pattern is emerging. And you can see that the inside portion is white, but there are dots clustered all around this within the triangle. But it is uh, around 800 to 1000 iterations will be required to actually see that indeed this pattern is, it is heading towards the Sierpinski triangle. This itself is a very fascinating thing that uh, you leave the, 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 the game is based on chance and yet what appears is again the Sierpinski triangle. And uh, well, the mathematical reasoning for this can be addressed in a higher class, but younger children can definitely play the game and see the pattern coming up. Now, to analyze this uh, Sierpinski, uh, the chaos game, we look at the various stages of the Sierpinski triangle and we can, to refer to the sub triangles at any stage, we can have what we call Sierpinski triangle addresses, which means that, you know, we label the triangles, sub triangles. So in stage one, we have three equilateral triangles, smaller equilateral triangles. We can call them T, L and R because this is the top triangle, this is the left and this is the right. And these are further subdivided. So in the case of stage two, I will call this TT because it is top of the top triangle. This is TL because it is left of the top triangle. And this is R TR because this is right of the top triangle. So a sequence of two letters is required to uh, give the addresses of this, all the nine subtriangles. Now, when you throw the dice once, and suppose you come up with a number one or two, then obviously, wherever you start with, the point that you get will land up in the triangle T. And now again, if you roll the dice and you have to move towards R, then you will see that the point will actually land up in TR. So you can trace the path uh, of the points by looking at the sub-triangles. So now in the next slide, there's a small challenge. Of course, I cannot take an audience poll here. But one interesting activity could be that you give them certain children, certain stages of the Sierpinski triangle and ask them to identify a particular triangle. So let us say we ask them to identify LTR in stage three or RTRL is a sequence of four letters. So this would be in stage four. Now LTR in stage three, so L is the first letter. So I will look at the left triangle first. Within that, I will look at the top triangle for T and within the top triangle, I'll look at the right triangle and that leads to this small black triangle, which I've marked as LTR. And similarly, one can identify RTRL in the stage four as this tiny triangle here. So as we go along, the number of stage, if it's, uh, if it's stage N, then you would require a sequence of N letters to identify the sub triangle at that stage. So you can actually play the game, make the children play the game and simulate uh, the die throws on a spreadsheet. And it would be interesting to say compute the average number of rolls of the dice required to produce a string of letters such that all the sub triangles of stage two, let us say, are reached. So to answer this, I would like to take you to another spreadsheet quickly. So again, I'll share my screen. I hope you can see the screen. So on the first row, you can see the die rolls have been simulated. So this is actually a rand between command one to six. And if I just drag this, I will get a new set of die rolls. And each of these get translated to their corresponding. So two stands for T, four stands for L and so on. 
And if I look, if I start from the right hand side and look at pairwise, look at the letters pairwise. The so last two letters are T and T. So I'll shade the triangle with address T T in in stage two. Then I move to L T, I shade that and L L and so on. So if there are repetitions, I ignore and proceed. So how many rolls on an average are required to shade all these sub triangles of stage two? Or it could be done for higher stages, but for stage two, one could explore. And this is interesting because every child can do this individually. And each child will come up with a different set of diet shows. And we, one could take the average of that and see what is happening to get an idea of the trend. Uh, you can also uh, ask questions on probability, like what would be the probability of arriving at triangle R at stage one in one role. So the probability of the point in chaos game arriving in triangle R would be one third because each of these T, L, and R are equally likely to come up. So for getting the sub triangle L, T, T, L, R, it would be one third into one third into one third, which is one upon 27. But if you modify the game, and let us say that you uh, say that T is represented by the die throws one, two, three, L is represented by four, five, and R is represented by six, then the probabilities are different. And you could answer similar questions as above. And, or you could ask a question like, uh, give an example of a stage four triangle, which has a probability of one upon 54 of containing a point in four rows. So one upon 54 means the children will have to express, split this into the probabilities half, one by three and one by six, and see what are the possibilities. So there's a lot of opportunity to explore this. And uh, in this slide, I have written process-wise, try to indicate what could be the mathematical aspect and what is the computational aspect. So in the Sierpinski triangle explorations, recursion can be observed both mathematically and computationally. So finding the recursive formula expressing attributes of the nth stage in terms of the n minus one stage is a mathematical aspect, but building different stages from smaller stages could be a computational aspect. Exploring geometric sequences emerging from the attributes and working with those sequences could be a mathematical aspect, but finding explicit number of rules uh, could be a computational aspect. Looking at the problem numerically and graphically can come under both CT and MT. When we look at links with the Pascal's triangle, the coloring, uh, the coloring problem which involves modular arithmetic is a mathematical aspect, but defining the coloring rules could be a computational aspect. And then working out probabilities uh, could come under the mathematical aspect, but simulating the game, chaos game on the spreadsheet could come under the computational aspect. It may not be important to make this distinction, but I just wanted to show that there is ample scope for having both CT and MT in this uh, Sierpinski triangle exploration. Uh, my apologies if I'm going a little fast, but I just wanted to also share a little bit about the Tower of Hanoi, which is, I think, a well-known game to many. Uh, so the traditional Tower of Hanoi consists of three pegs and uh, circular disks of reducing radii, which are uh, placed as a, in the form of a tower on one of the pegs. In this case, it is in the middle peg in the picture, but it can be on any one of the three pegs. The problem lies in shifting the tower from one peg to another peg using only two conditions. Only one disk can be moved at a time, and at any point of time, the bigger disk cannot be placed on a smaller disk. So these are the two conditions of the Tower of Hanoi problem. The problem is to compute the minimum number of moves by which you can shift this tower from one peg to another. This game was given to a group of uh, first year students in a teacher education program who did not have, uh, who did not have, many of them did not have mathematics in 11th and 12th, and some of them did. But the idea was to uh, make them engage with this problem and engage, elicit their mathematical thinking as well as computational thinking. So the first part required them to, they were given, assigned these uh, Tower of Hanoi models in groups, and they had to play with the, uh, with the model and estimate the minimum number of moves. Interestingly, uh, the range, uh, the, their estimates ranged from 34 to 80 even. And there were six disks in the model given to them. 
Then they were asked to simplify the problem and play the game with a reduced number of disks and see a pattern. So these two tasks were posed. So we said, let n be the represent the number of disks and tn represent the minimum number of moves. So compute tn for n equal to 2, 3, 4, and so on. So can you see a pattern as you keep on adding the disks? And can you express t of n in terms of tn minus 1? So this is the problem posed to them. Then they were also asked to find the recursive rule. So can you find the minimum number of, can you express the minimum number of moves in terms of n itself? So as they tabulated the information, uh, they were playing with the disks. Uh, they reduced it to one, two disks, and so on. So when it came to, let's say, two disks, the little diagram here which shows that there are two disks. The bigger disk is the pink disk, and the smaller disk is the blue disk. And suppose you have to move this to another peg. So the first move would require you to shift the blue disk onto one of the other two pegs, suppose the middle peg. The lowest uh, pink disk moves to the third peg, and in the last move, the blue disk is shifted back to on top of the pink disk. So now the tower has shifted from the first peg to the last peg. So three moves are required for two disks. If you add a third disk, then one can notice that the top two disks will require three moves to be shifted to one peg. The lowest disk can move in one move, and the other uh, two which can be brought on top of that using three moves. So there would be a pattern of three plus one plus three for three disks, for shifting three disks, which is seven. And so this, as they played along, they found the pattern that the number of move, minimum number of moves for any number of disks is twice the minimum number for the previous number of disks plus one. And this they were able to write in the form of n. So t of n became two times t of n minus one plus one. So this was a recursive rule. And then they explored the sequence, which was one, three, seven, 15, 31. And they came to 63 because their model had six disks. So for six disks, the minimum number of moves is 63. And then they looked at the differences among these numbers. And finally, with some scaffolding, they realized that each of these numbers had some was one less than a power of two and they arrived at the explicit rule also. That was, of course, an observation. And later, they had to prove it using the principle of mathematical induction. I'm not getting into that in this presentation. But this was an interesting way for them to see the pattern and express it explicitly and recursively. Uh, another interesting aspect of the Tower of Hanoi problem, which was explored by the students, is that of Hanoi graphs. So Hanoi graphs are actually diagrammatic representations of the states and the moves. So by a state, I mean, so for example, suppose, I hope the diagram is clear to the audience. This is a, a three pegs, and the, suppose we number them as 0, 1, and 2. And let's suppose there is a single disk, and that is placed on peg 0. So we represent this state this position of the disk on peg 0 as a single dot uh, labeled 0. If the disk was on peg 2, we would represent it the single dot by 2. And if the disk is on peg 1, we would represent it by 1. And only one move is required to shift the disk from peg 0 to, say, peg 1. So I join 0 to 1 with a line. And this way, movement is possible. So this is a particular state. These are these three are different states of the position of the disk, and the lines or the edges uh, represent that a single move is possible to move from one state to the other. So this simple triangular representation is called uh, is the trivial case of the Hanoi graph, which is called H13. Three of pegs, which is three for the problem, and one represents the number of disks. It can also be written as HD, comma P, where D represents the number of disks, number of pegs. So this is a simple case. But when students were asked to look at what happens for two disks. So in this diagram, the positions of the two disks are given. So there are nine states possible. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. And each of these states is represented by a sequence of two digits. So 0, 0 would mean that two disks, the bigger disk and the smaller disk, are placed on the single peg 0. 
And therefore, each of these states is represented by a, a, a sequence of two numbers, two digits. So zero, zero, and you can move from zero, zero to zero, one in a single move. So what you have to do is you just shift the smaller disk to the peg one, and that is, so you can move from this state to this state in just one move. So zero, zero to zero, one is joined by a line. So in this graph that you see, there's a, a line represents the fact that you can move from state, let's say zero, one to zero, two in just one move, or zero, two to one, two in just one move. And something interesting started happening. So students saw that three copies of the previous uh, Hanoi graph, that is H13, this is actually H23, is actually residing inside H23. And when they did it for three disks, I have not been able to show the actual position of the disk, but the Hanoi graph H33 looks like this. So H23 shows is this, and there are three copies of H23 in H33. So there's a self-similar pattern in a Sierpinski-like self-similar pattern even in the Hanoi graphs. And this is a student's diagrammatic representation. So she uses the color coding to show that there are these blue, yellow, and pink uh, vertices represent the triangles H13. And there are three copies of H13 in H23 and three copies of H23 in H33 and so on. Uh, you can use Mathematica to generate uh, the Hanoi graphs and see the self-similar structure. It very much re resembles a skeletal version of the Sierpinski triangle. And counting the number of vertices and edges and coming up with recursive rules for the number of vertices and edges was an interesting task that the students engaged in. So vertices are the corners. So H13 has three vertices, and H23 has three times three, which is nine vertices. So the number of vertices are powers of three, but the number of edges have a more interesting pattern. So the students discovered that pattern and they wrote that in the recursive form. They also connected the moves of the Hanoi graph to, uh, so for example, in H23, we know that to move to this, a minimum number of uh, moves required is three. So they identified the moves in terms of paths. So if you start with this corner, zero, zero, you move on to this, which is 0, 1. Then you move on to this, which is 2, 1. And you move on to this, which is 2, 2. So three moves are required. And that path is represented on the Hanoi graph. So they did a lot of playing around with paths along the Hanoi graphs, uh, which led to the minimum, which represented the minimum number of moves. So once again, this uh, problem, the, the, the tar of Hanoi problem, can be a wonderful way to explore recursion the pictorial representations of the Hanoi graphs lead to uh, exploring self-similarity, which is a computational aspect. But if they had to actually find formulae for the number of vertices and edges, that would come under the mathematical aspect. So the numerical, so they actually explored the problem using multiple representations. That is pictorially, graphically, I mean, in terms of Hanoi graphs, numerically. And so that led to a deeper understanding of the problem. And they were quite eager to explore what happens in the four peg case. So uh, I would slowly like to conclude now. But uh, just I would like to share a little bit about uh, this group of researchers in the National University of Singapore, Professor Wenking Ho et al., his group, are looking at some design principles uh, for CTMP integration. So though this may not be a hard and fast rule that one needs to follow, but it might be helpful to teachers when they're looking at certain tasks. So first thing that they ask, there are four principles involved in this framework. And the complexity principle is asking whether the problem that you are selecting or the task that you are selecting, uh, does, the, does the mathematical con, uh, concept embedded in it give rise to a sufficiently complex problem? So it, does the student find it worth exploring? And can it be decomposed into simpler tasks? The mathematics principle is that can the problem be expressed in mathematical terms? So in the case of Sierpinski and the Tower of Hanoi, definitely there was a lot of mathematics that they could explore, be it to finding the explicit and recursive rule, proving them using the principle of mathematical induction, engaging with the concepts of probability. So there was a lot of mathematics already ingrained in these problems. The data principle, are the concepts observable through data? 
can the data be collected or created? So in this case, the spreadsheet does help to create the data. In the case of the Tower of Hanoi, Mathematica helped to generate higher versions of the Hanoi graph so that they could see patterns. And the computa computability principle asks that does the problem lend itself to exploration by a technology? So in the case of both these uh, tasks which I've just described, technology can play a very significant role. So I would now come to the implications for the curriculum and say that uh, mathematics is a core school subject and it provides many contexts for computational thinking. Uh, computationally mediated learn math learning environment can develop both CT and MT skills. So perhaps we know that schools have functioning computer labs and they also have mathematics labs. But is it possible to integrate and think of a computational mathematics lab where the children are engaged in projects and activities which are not just programming based like in a computer lab or not, not just only mathematically based, but can there be an integration of the two? By engaging in computational thinking practices such as problem decomposition, abstraction, generalization, data collection, and analysis, the student may be motivated to develop mathematical thinking. And technology, again, can play a significant role in mediating both CT and MT. So I would like to conclude with a quote uh, from Papert's Mindstorms, who said that before computers, there were, very, there were very few good points of contact between what is most fundamental and engaging in mathematics and anything firmly planted in everyday life. But the computer, a mathematics-speaking being, in the midst of everyday life of the home, school, and workplace is able to provide such links. The challenge of education is to find ways to exploit them. With this, I'd like to thank uh, the audience for a patient listening, for being so participative. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Janaki, can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to begin with this question from uh, Jayashri of Shubodhya Vidyalaya, who is asking, how do you assess computational thing? And uh, How do you assess? Okay. How do you assess computational thinking? Right. Yeah. So um, I don't think there is a very uh, specific uh, rubric which helps you to assess computational thinking. But uh, one possibility is that, like I showed you in one of the slides, that you, uh, you look at computational aspects of the problem. You assign a task, look at mathematical and computational aspects. And you try to see if the child is engaging in any of those aspects, such as is the uh, is there is the is there a kind of a logical coding required? So, for example, when you are creating a spreadsheet to explore a problem, you have to input some kind of a logical uh, command. But that logical command can come from the child only if he or she has understood the problem from a computational aspect. So, you can find out certain markers in your task, which, if the child is doing, then you can consider it as computational thinking. I hope that answers uh, the question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, There's a question from uh, Ms. Christina Leslie of Rajagiri School. She's asking, uh, how can you integrate uh, CT and MT for, uh, at the primary or elementary stage? She's, many of the examples we were talking about maybe at the secondary stage. She's asking whether you have any particular yes. ones for younger ones. Yes, uh, actually, some of the examples that I shared, the example which I shared could even be done at the middle school level. But if you had to look at the primary level, uh, there are, uh, that there could be tasks where, you know, they're related to uh, patterns in numbers, for example. And can the children be asked to explore that on a spreadsheet? Because even young children, as young in grades four and five, can easily work with spreadsheets. Because a spreadsheet does not is not very intensive in terms of programming. Simple commands can generate data, and children can be encouraged to see patterns within that data. 
So uh, concepts dealing with number systems, concepts uh, dealing with base conversions, converting uh, numbers being converted from one base to another, and uh, prime factorization. These are uh, mathematical uh, processes that children deal with in grades four and five. And it is possible to create simple uh, tasks which they can explore using a spreadsheet, which I feel would lead to both, uh, would elicit both their mathematical as well as computational thinking. Okay, thank you. Uh, here is a question from Mr. Mani of uh, IEEE, who's asking, how do you bring connection with everyday life? Pardon me, how do you? How do you bring a connection with everyday life? in the kind of tasks that you're talking about. Okay. That kind of, you're mostly talking about yes, abstract sir. tasks and I'm asking. Okay. Well, uh, to bring that everyday life uh, connect, I guess uh, one would, would pick up some real life problems. Uh, but again, uh, for example, there was one experiment I had once done with students. Again, there were uh, grades uh, 9, 10, 11 kind of age group. Uh, they were not young children, uh, but they uh, looked at a queuing system. So they actually observed how queues are formed and they tried to simulate that information on a spreadsheet. And then they tried to calculate things like, you know, how to minimize waiting time. So it was a real life problem where they observed how queues are being formed at a petrol pump and another group observed at a fast food joint. And then they tried to simulate that uh, using uh, a spreadsheet. So that was something which gave them a very uh, real life connect. But even simple experiments like you know rolling a dice, for example, and seeing patterns within that. So probability can have a lot of interesting simulation examples which can be accessible to younger children. And when you talk of probability, of course, uh, you can make connections with real life as well. OK. Uh, here is a question from Abhirami Sundari. And she's asking, what is the difference between and computational thinking? Pardon, I lost your connection. Sorry. Uh, Could you what please is repeat the, the question? difference? Yeah. What is the difference between programming and computational thinking? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, in fact, uh, what I was mentioning about Papert and I was mentioning about Jeanette Wing also, and all the people who are. Uh, the stalwarts in this area firmly believe that you know computational thinking is a lot more than coding and programming. So all these, the, it's a way of thinking. So when you are solving the problem, you are applying logic. So before you actually come to the stage of coding a problem, you have to think of the logical uh, logic behind it to be able to write the code. So very often, you know, in children, for example, when they're in a computer lab and they're writing a, they have to write a computer program for a certain problem, the computer gives a feedback that it. Now, this is a very healthy thing because it helps, debugging means that they have to retrace the steps with which they arrived at that program and they have to rectify it. Whereas, unfortunately, in a mathematics classroom, that never happens. Because in a mathematics classroom, it is always there is this one right answer, and everybody has to achieve that. So by rectifying your finding your own mistakes and celebrating that, when you make a mistake, you have to rectify it. So you really learn. When you rectify that mistake, you actually learn a lot more. So the computational thinking entails all these other aspects, such as pattern recognition, uh, it also entails you know, abstraction. So once you've seen a pattern, you have to explicitly state its rule ex in recursive form or explicit form, like we did in the case of the Sapinski triangle. So even if I did not use any coding at all in the two examples that I showed today, uh, there was still enough scope to engage in both CT and MT. I hope okay. uh, that answers uh, the question. Yeah. Uh here is a question from Aniki Dev of Scholar High School, Mumbai. Uh, he's asking what to do. Uh, how do you establish a CTMT lab in school? And what kind of contents would be needed to set up such a lab? Yes. Um, 
I think, uh, of course, the lab has to be equipped with uh, computers and uh, uh, it needs to have, children have to be given access to certain kinds of software tools. So, for example, uh, as I was showing you today that uh, Mathematica is actually a licensed software, but a free version of it is available on Wolfram Cloud. So you can just create your account on Wolfram Cloud and you can use Mathematica to some extent. Then there are dynamic geometry software tools like GeoGebra, which is very popular. And of course, there are various kinds of spreadsheets also available. So at least these three kinds of tools are necessary to explore mathematical problems. Uh, the dynamic geometry software tools, the computer algebra systems. And uh, so they would, I think what is more important, more than the infrastructure and the softwares, what is important is what tasks need, the children need to go through. So I think it is possible to look at the mathematics curriculum and look at all those topics where you can integrate computational thinking. So for example, uh, the topics to do with number systems, sequences and series, probability, these are all areas, discrete mathematics basically. These are areas where you can integrate computational thinking very easily. So to start with, one could begin with uh, developing tasks like that. Okay. Um, so here's a. Can you hear me? And I was sharing the design principles. Uh, your voice breaking up, Janaki. Can you? You hear me? Uh, so this group in, in National University of Singapore. Uh, Janaki, can you hear me?
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Am I audible now? Okay. Sorry, I ah, lost. Yes, it. you are. Yeah. I'm sorry, I lost connection. Yes. Uh, okay. So, can you hear me, Janaki? Yes. Yes. Now I can. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here is a question from Anupama Shivkumar, who is asking. Uh, decision making using flowchart to represent word problems uh, yes. involving mixed operations can it be used as a step to can it be a step towards computational thinking absolutely uh, no. yes. sorry yeah yes. so uh, yes so decision trees making decision trees for problems in probability for example uh, so there are very interesting problems where you know to find uh, to create the sample space uh, you would have to create a decision tree, or there are very interesting problems where uh, I, I tried this experiment with students on something, some well-known problems known as coin weighing problems, where you know you have a sequence of identical-looking coins, and one is a defective coin, and with a minimum number of weighings, you have to figure out which is the defective coin. So when students started engaging with this problem, it was found that when they made a decision tree or a flowchart. Uh, they could represent the solution in a very interesting way, which would be communicated to others very easily. So I think the use of decision trees in various topics, wherever it is possible, would definitely come under the aspect of computational thinking. Okay. Uh, so I think we are almost uh, over time. So. And there are a couple of questions, so I'll combine them into a single one, uh, which is really about the COVID situation, uh, where uh, the connectivity is very poor, and uh, technology, uh, you know, many students don't access to technology. So how would you recommend uh, uh, doing all this in, for instance, rural areas or areas of uh, poor access to digital or connectivity issues? That's the question well, that some people have. Right. Sadly, that's a problem we are all grappling with, educators, where how to reach out to students who have do not have connectivity. Um, well, if you have the computer screen in front of you, it is very easy to conduct experiments because children can see through screen sharing what is happening. Even if you have access to a phone, uh, like if, but at least that would require a smartphone because I had some students who did not have access to a laptop, but you know they could access a spreadsheet on a smartphone. So when I was taking live classes, I did I could not ask them to bring computers, uh, laptops with them, but they were all generating uh, the problem. They were ex exploring the problem using the spreadsheet on their smartphones. But if you don't have access to a smartphone, it would be difficult to do these uh, tasks. But I guess if a teacher can talk to the student, a group of students through a phone and give them instructions, so you know, a simple games which they can play uh, sitting at home, maybe with a sibling, or you know, they can uh, things related to you know again throw a rolling of a dice or any kind of uh, step by step thing in anything which can be given a step by step instruction from which they can create some uh, generate some pattern and explore that pattern themselves. But it would be very hard to do it. Uh, it would be challenging. But I think it is also possible to um, create small videos and share uh, in some form where children can see some experiment being conducted, uh, which entails some mathematical thinking and computational thinking. But yes, in these challenging times, it would be difficult to do much of this, uh, given the lack of access to a large proportion of the population. Thank you very much. Thanks, Junaki. On that note, I'll hand it back to Vipul for concluding this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank Junaki for the excellent talk and Jam for hosting the session. Uh, I'm sure the teachers will carry back a lot of learnings. Uh, I, I'm, I'm waiting to try out the triangles so uh, thanks to the audience. Thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the recording will be available from tomorrow. And uh, just to let you know, Professor Dan Garcia from University of California, Berkeley, 
will be our next speaker uh, on August 29. Until then, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.